We're so glad you're here. If you would take your seats for this really important part um, of our conference, the awards ceremony. We're so excited to be able to celebrate four individuals and two organizations who are doing really inspiring and outstanding work um, in our state. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Erica Valiant, who is an MCH board member and a staff member at People Serving People in Minneapolis. You heard from her this morning. Um, and she's going to be able to share um, the Lieutenant Governor's remarks. Uh, unfortunately, the Lieutenant Go Governor had planned to be here with us this morning, but she is ill. And so Erica is going to share with you the words that she had prepared for all of you um, in her deep gratitude for your advocacy and partnership. It's a lot dark up here. All right. Boost who to all of you incredible activists and allies in the room who have come together with the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless with a common goal. I want to say thank you for your tireless advocacy last session. It was one for the history books. Together, your innovative ideas, tireless advocacy, and community-led solutions helped shape the largest investment in housing and homelessness in state history, Organizing Works. Many of you know that one of my biggest passions as Lieutenant Governor is leading the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness. This session, the Governor and I signed an interagency budget for housing stability that is over $2.6 billion through the next four years. Thank you. It will have transformative impacts on the continuum of housing needs from preventing and ending homelessness, to creating a healthy rental market for low-income renters, to closing the disparities in home ownership. The investments focus on increasing the amount of, and affordability of housing and shelter, as well as making sure housing is accessible to everyone. It is focused on preventing homelessness whenever possible and providing the kinds of services and supports people need to find and keep their housing. Y'all, we tripled the ongoing investment in the Homeless Youth Act, much of this work led by Representative Keeler, who you heard from yesterday. In this budget, we increased by 400% the ongoing resources for the emergency services program. We signed into law the first ever $100 million in capital to create and improve shelter. We provide a massive one-time infusion into our family homeless prevention and assistance program. And with this budget, we provided the first government-to-government -government direct allocation to tribal nations and an incredible $35 million per year ongoing. Okay. We were given the opportunity of a lifetime with the surplus we had in a moment of fully aligned leadership across the House, Senate, and administration. We were ready to seize the moment we did because of you. You had been doing the work for years and telling us clearly that more was needed. Thank you for your persistence and your voice and for keeping the faith. This budget is the fuel we need to implement the housing, racial, and, wealth, and health justice plan for people facing homelessness in Minnesota. This plan has been created in direct partnership with 10 justice consultants with lived expertise in homelessness. They were hired by our Interagency Council on Homelessness to co-lead and drive our work toward justice. They have forever changed the way we do our work at the state. They are here today. Please stand. Hey. And they are presenting the session later in the day, not to be missed. As the preamble to our justice plan states, Minnesota bears ongoing injuries as a result of structural racism, genocide, and economic inequities, which continues to define housing instability and homelessness today. We have so much more work to do. The governor and I and all of the agencies of the Interagency Council on Homelessness are committed to a plan that will repair and transform unjust systems that have caused and perpetuate 
housing instability, and homelessness. Recognize people facing homelessness as relatives and our collective responsibility to each other is rooted in mutual care and radical hospitality. Empower people who have been faced with homelessness and housing instability to identify and describe the problems to be solved, design the solutions needed for those problems, and implement and evaluate those solutions. Hold each other and systems accountable in the work to achieve housing, racial, and health justice for people experiencing homelessness. And we will continue to do this work arm in arm with each of the 100 member organizations that compromise Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. And together, we will work to ensure all Minnesotans can grow and thrive with a roof over their heads. And one additional note, starting this year, families can claim our new child tax credit by filling out one form on the Department of Revenue's website. And eligible families will receive $1,750 per child with no cap on the number of children to pay for car repair, new shoes, food on the table, and of course, housing. <laughs> now, as we move into the award ceremony, many of you have been nominated this year for your outstanding leadership, advocacy, and impact in community to help end homelessness and ensure that every Minnesotan has safe, dignified, affordable, and an accessible, uh, accessible place to live. It's people and organizations like yours that help make Minnesota the best state to raise a family. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to Rhonda, who is gonna lead us in the fun part, giving out awards. Thank you, Erica, and I'm actually um, happy, very happy to invite um, and have Laquita Love Limo as um, we're going to tag team this um, ceremony um, in announcing the winners um, as the Lieutenant Governor was also going to help with that. So um, you may know Laquita as one of the award winners from last year, um, but she's also the SMAC director or SMAC COC coordinator. coordinator and an MCH Advocacy Fellow for the next year. So thank you, Laquita. Well, you, I think you can kick it off. You've got the first one. Awesome, and it is a pleasure to have the very first one. So let's give it up for the Rising Star Award. This year, we recognize Michael Giovannis. Oh, we're going to hold our applause because we got a lot to say about Michael. So first of all, the, the Rising Star Award recognizes individuals with fewer than five years of experience um, and will shine a light on their commitment to addressing homelessness and advancing housing stability. Michael has made such a huge impact in a short amount of time that anyone who has a chance to meet him always leaves the interaction with a sense of renown, hope, and dedication to ending homelessness. The nomination form says it all about Michael. Michael is an individual with lived experience and a passion for change. Michael is the current director of development and operations for Close Knit. Close Knit is an advocacy organization focusing on the needs of homeless youth. As a result of the unexpected exit of the past executive director, Michael was thrust into leadership and excelled. Michael maintained the operations and never missed a beat. In addition to the work, he completes within Close Knit. He is also a strong community advocate. He has testified for legislation and serves as a voice for the homeless youth in many groups and coalitions in his personal time. Michael is dedic is dedic ah, Michael's dedication is lifelong and goes well beyond his work with Close Knit. I know there are a lot of big players in this room, but his passion and dedication needs to be recognized to be an in an environment where you share your personal experience deserves to be applauded. Sometimes work in this field can be hard because change can be slow, amen to that. But his dedication and willingness to give, his, give selflessly never wavers. I think receiving recognition will propel his dedication and give him the appreciation he has never sought before. In addition to Michael's work with Close Knit, he is also a core leader of the Lived Experience Network, also known as LEAN, a consultant for Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness, and is deeply engaged in his local community's efforts to end homelessness. Let's give it up for Michael Giovannis. So 
So our next award is the Luminary Award, and it gives recognition to individuals with at least five years of experience in serving their, their community. This award shines a light on their commitment to advancing housing stability here in Minnesota. This year's winner is Tamara Stark. Tamara serves as Tubman's Senior Director of Housing and Youth Development and has been with the organization for 25 years. She is a highly sought after resource at the local, state, and national level for her depth of expertise in intersectional trauma informed services to youth, adults, and families, and is also tremendously skilled in organizational, team, and community leadership. In the words of a community leader, Tamara just gets it when it comes to advocacy and working to end homelessness. Tamara brings an entrepreneurial mindset to all aspects of her work and knows the power of asking powerful questions. She can answer tough questions, and when she doesn't know the answer, she leverages her network to find one. She shows up and brings others along, both literally and figuratively, uplifting and supporting people with her strength-based leadership style and enjoys mentoring people of all ages to help them succeed. Our next award is the Catalyst Award. And this award honors individuals who are champions in advocating for systematic change. This year's winner for the Seven County Metro is Renal Ray. Renal is a fierce mother, wife, nonprofit leader, public policy professional, teacher, trainer, advocate, lawyer, and leader in the housing advocacy and policy world. She has led public policy efforts with the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, participated in the Community Equity Program, taught public policy at Metro State University, was the CEO of People Serving People, and is now an assistant commissioner for Minnesota Housing. As stated in her nomination form, she is strong, passionate, and steadfast in her commitment to the community and racial justice and working to, oper to operationalize love as a public good. She is a true catalyst for change. In addition to these great credentials, she is very relatable and an, an amazing teacher. There are so many advocates that have benefited from her leadership that is impossible to quantify. Renal Ray. Our Catalyst Award winner for this year from Greater Minnesota is Jane Lorenz. There have been two different eras of Jane's career. Both have been dedicated to an ending homelessness. There is the pre-retired Jane and the retired Jane. The retired Jane continues to do this work because she is dedicated, passionate, and enjoys helping others as much as possible. We don't really have time to go through her entire career, so instead we're gonna read what was written in her nomination form, as it does a much a beautiful job of recognizing Jane and her work. Indigenous people have always been forced to understand the dominant society, but she has learned to understand ours. She has joined us on our healing journey and has the wisdom, commitment, and desire to assist my people in building a stronger, more self-reliant indigenous community. As we journey and succeed at each step, she reaches back with a helping hand along the way. She listens with her heart and treats every person with respect at all times. As her nominator wrote, Jane is one of the luminaries of my people. For me, I call her Gichimuku Kanikwe or Nibwaka Ikwe as it, that means she walks with us. Jane Lorenz. Up next is the Northern Lights Organizational Award. This shines a light upon incredible organizations that are making significant contributions to advancing housing stability in Minnesota. This year's winner for Greater Minnesota is the American Indian Community Housing Organization, also known as ACO. They are a national example of how culturally specific programming can be led by residents and staff to, that reflect their community. 
as quoted in their website, indigenous people not only have solutions for ourselves, but for the world at large. And ACO is a shining example of how this can look in the efforts to end homelessness. Their staff are dedicated and passionate about their vision, which is to honor the resilience of Native American people by strengthening communities and centering indigenous values in all aspects of their work. They provide housing and supportive services while also managing arts, cultural, and food sovereignty initiatives. As you visit Duluth, be sure to watch for artworks such as murals and billboards. While the art is beautiful, it has meaning behind it. it has meaning behind it as well. Whether you're driving downtown Duluth or walking in Canal Park, you'll see this beautiful and powerful art. We encourage you to pause and reflect on what it means. To give one example of how ACO provides holistic support, they started their food sovereignty work in a grassroots style with a few garden boxes and is now developing the region's first indigenous food market and will develop 10 acres into indigenous growing and learning space. They are community they are supporting and advocating for, which is why they are so good at what they do. Let's hear it for our Northern Lights Award winners. Our second Northern Lights Award winner uh, is from the Seven County Metro, and it is Street Voices of Change with Align Minneapolis. Street Voices of Change is a powerful community of leaders who have been or are experiencing homelessness. They are being recognized because of their tremendous leadership and advocated for needed changes to not only end homelessness, but to ensure that a person's experience while homeless is dignified, safe, and includes the ability to work on self-identified goals. Whatever space they are in, they enhance the work and the outcomes. This is not only because so much this is not easy because so much of the homeless response system is complicated and not always person-centered. But they do not let this stop them from doing what they know is right. In addition to Street Voices of Change, Align Minneapolis provides organizational support while allowing their legislative advocacy to be led and driven by Street Voices of Change. Align Minneapolis is a tr tremendous example of how to be a community partner while pushing for change to redefine the status quo. Align has deep trust with st street voices of change, knowing that people most impacted by homelessness are also closest to the solutions. With that in mind, Align pr provides as much as support as they can. Let's give it up for Align and Street Voices for Change. So now we're going to invite the, uh, each of the award winners um, up to the stage, and we are going to uh, do a picture. All right, so I want to just say I am super happy to be sitting up here with such phenomenal people. I have met or worked with each of these individuals on some level. Greatness in the room. So give them one more round of applause, please. And so I'm gonna start with one simple question. Have you had an experience that has touched your heart and or made you feel compassion? I wanna start with Michael. Sure. Um... I guess yesterday we had um, a barbecue for lived experience advocates who are up here at the conference so they could meet each other from the different groups and network. Um, and one of my colleagues, Charlie, was on the way back to the Airbnb our nonprofit is renting for our staff that are staying here. And uh, Charlie saw a, a guy who needed assistance and so she pulled over and started talking to him and struck up a conversation. Um, and ended up inviting him to the barbecue. Um, and that really touched my heart, like Charlie reaching out to a stranger that she'd never met before who was clearly in need and kind of bringing him into our, our family in a way. Um, I, that was really beautiful to me, so that touched me. Awesome, that is great. The concept of family is always amazing. Um, Tamara? 
Thank you, Laquita. Yes, I actually yesterday did an outreach event with a bunch of other people from different agencies in the metro and had so many people coming up and sharing their journey, overcoming different traumas, racism, being unhoused, and then feeling so lifted up by hearing that they're, they have expertise. So as awful as it is to go through that, they have leadership and expertise that we need uh, from those experiences to help end homelessness. And just those simple words sharing with people are often so inspiring. And, it, and someone shared that directly back with me that they never thought of it that way, that what they have to share is a gift to the community, even though they went through challenges and that they deserve to be invested in. Thank you for that. Renal, same question. So I'm gonna take it back to my early years and my formative years and um, share a little bit about kind of what, how I ended up doing the kind of work that I do. So my family was the, the my parents were the first in, the, in this country from India. And growing up, we served, our house served as a host. When folks were arriving, they would stay with us until they found stability and they would move on. And in that multi-generational environment, living environment, I learned so much about what it means to care for community, to share resources and to be with community. And this morning I got to be in the tribal collaborative session. And as you all were sharing about um, the seven grandfathers, it really touched me and it reminded me of the lessons I learned from my own family. So that's, that's kind of something that's sticking out to me today. Jane, same question. Well, fortunately we got these questions ahead of time because that was helpful so we could think, but probably over 25 years ago, a friend of mine and I volunteered at the House of Cherry to serve Thanksgiving dinner. And we were just about ready to serve the dinner and it was, everybody was, and everyone was starting to line up and it was mostly older men. Um, many of them looked pretty tough, pretty rough. And then all of a sudden, a little boy showed up. He was maybe nine years old, 10 years old, completely alone. He wasn't with anyone else. And everyone just stood back and let him go first. And no one knew where he came from or who he was. And it's always stuck with me. It was interesting to watch how the people who were experiencing homelessness treated this young, young little boy. And it really kept in my mind of how sometimes the people that have the very least have the most compassion. And that's just always stuck with me. Thank you so much. So I just want to acknowledge the common theme of leading with love and treating everyone as your universal family. I appreciate that in all of you guys. So my next question is, what inspires you and how can we inspire others? And I want to start with Tamara. Yeah, well, fortunately, I through this work and just life in general, there's always challenges, of course, yet I make a point to find something that inspires me each day and, and even challenges bring different perspectives and opportunities. So I think for me, it's really what's meaningful to people we're connecting with, what's meaningful to community and looking at things that are more not just cookie cutter, but personalized and that things are done through relationships and, and that's what matters. And those little things are, are what fill us up and we recognize those as so important and how we find space for that in all our work too. So you've heard this big theme, I think, uh, as Laquita shared about leading with love. And I think that's just what fills me up is the meaning and purpose all around. And Renal, what inspires you? Yeah. People, first and foremost, I'm looking at Erica Valiant over there, who is a source of inspiration for me. Um, I think about the families and the kids that I got to meet and know at People Serving People. I think about the Family Financial Empowerment Collaborative Action Committee, the SHIP Collaborative, Street Voices for Change, all of the folks who have turned experiences um, and perhaps pain into purpose and power 
to change systems. That's what inspires me to figure out what my contribution um, into that is. How can I use the skills and the tools and the access and the power that I have to help create and shift change? Uh, so that's what really inspires me. And if I bring it a little bit closer to home, I think about my son. I have a seven-year-old. Uh, his name is Rohan. And um, I know that, you know, there's that saying, Paul Wellstone, and I love the saying, we all do better when we all do better. I believe that. And actually, I also believe that we all do better when those furthest from justice and those furthest from access do better. Uh, that's when we all do better, and that's when my kid will do better. So I never do what I'm told. So Jane, <laughs> what inspired you then? Because you're post-retirement. What inspired you pre-retirement and what inspires you post-retirement? Um, pre-retirement, I think it was- Close uh, to your mouth. Closer? Yeah, okay. there you go. Oh, there, that just make a difference. <laughs> um, pre-retirement, I think it was uh, working with my coworkers at Department of Human Services, Minnesota Housing, Corrections, and then all the people we worked with that were partners with us. Um, Post-retirement, I have to say the Minnesota Travel Collaborative uh, has been incredibly inspiring. They never, ever quit working, um, and they never <laughs> give up on an opportunity to do something differently for their communities. Their unofficial motto is we always show up and we never give up, and that has just been so inspiring to me. So, And they're just wonderful, wonderful people to work with. So thank awesome, thank you. <laughs> and Michael, what inspires you? I gotta say, first and foremost, the people with lived experience out here who are frequently re-traumatizing themselves, who have been through the most difficulties and still have the passion and the courage to show up. I mean, that's just, it's so incredible to me, it's amazing. But I also think it's the people of Minnesota in general. I, con I constantly am being inspired. I think uh, last week I was at the uh, Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Housing, and one of our one of our members who serves on the board with me, uh, he his name's Bruce Brunner, and he was talking about how he's buying units, uh, buying buildings specifically to turn them into stable homes, stable schools, units, and Section 8 housing. And he talks about how his, his passion and his motivation in that work is, is people-centered and how he cares about every single family and all of his buildings that are on Section 8 are, are getting a unit through stable homes, stable schools. And he knows their first names. He knows their, the workers assigned to them. He, cares about them and you know I see landlords or housing providers getting a bad rap uh, and I definitely think the national ones there's a lot of issues but I do think like there's good people out there and they're doing amazing work and so yeah all these people who are passionate and selfless really inspire me awesome thank you y'all are picking up what they are putting down. Let's serve people. Let's be people-centric. Let's love on folks. Let's keep people at the forefront. I appreciate that. So I'm going to ask <clears throat> Renal, what are you doing differently? What, what, what in your work or about you is going against the status quo? So when I first read this question, I'm like, I don't know. I don't think I'm really doing anything differently. Um, but then when I thought about it, I, trying to, to acknowledge some of the things that I do do, which is it's really easy for me to connect dots. Um, and I think that this comes from my own lived experience at the intersection of being an immigrant, being a woman, being first generation. Um, that, that ability to connect dots and to see how things could go and to figure out what could be possible to understand what's happening in somebody's day-to-day -day experience and figure out what are the systems that are connected to that and what can we do to flip a lever in one way or what do we need to do to flip a lever in another way to prevent the experience of, of homelessness. Um, that's something that I think my training and my experience has 
has really helped me be able to do and to know because I've learned the value of my own lived experience, I know that I can recognize and respect and uplift the value of others' lived experience. And that, that I think, is, is really been helpful for all of the amazing work that I've been able to do with families and leaders at People Serving People um, and in the past as well. Thank you. Jay Lorenz, what are you doing differently? I'm trying to listen more and talk less. Every day I fail at it, <laughs> but trying. <laughs> um, I think one thing, one of the benefits about getting older is you stop worrying about what people think and you become a little bit more fearless and you start speaking your mind, which may be really annoying for everybody else, but <laughs> it sometimes is an important way to be a good advocate. Thank you so much, Jane. And Michael, what are you doing? Um, I guess what I'm doing differently is that I'm not trying to do anything new. I'm a big operations nerd. That's kind of my day-to-day -day job. Um, and so like what I love doing is supporting existing work. Um, and like that's the whole purpose with Lean, the Lived Experience Advocacy Network, is we always say, we're not trying to do anything new. We're just trying to connect all this amazing work that's already happening. So I think that's something that I do differently is that I, I don't try to do anything new. My passion is uplifting others' work. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> Tamara, what are you doing differently? Thank you. Well, I think drawing on a lot of stuff I went through just in life, right? And doing peer support as a child, which was something different at the time, yet so valuable and I think brought me to where I am today in these roles and capacities of service. And so sadly, I think some of the doing differently has been working always to center and amplify the people directly impacted by challenges faced and make sure they're well resourced to drive the changes that you know they see a need for. And that has often created a space that is very outside the box and not funded then. So kind of, uh, I, I, it's really exciting to see what happened this last session where I think more of that is coming into just general practice. And that is because of the tireless advocacy of so many of all of you in this room and people beyond and so many people that don't even know they've helped shape this way forward for the future. So I'm trying to take mental notes to make sure I'm learning all the right things. So be fearless. Don't shut up. Uh, <laughs> don't try to reinvent the wheel. And harness your intersectionalities to create more power. I got it. I, thank y'all. That's great. So my next question, is there anything you want the audience to know? And I'm going to start with Jane. So. My pre-retirement, I worked for the government. I issued RFPs, reviewed RFPs, sent out checks, looked at progress reports, made monitoring visits. Post-retirement, I'm writing those proposals, getting on everybody to get their reporting in, <laughs> get their finances in. And I would really like to ask my former state workers, Department of Corrections, Public Safety, Minnesota Housing, Human Services. If you could work this year to come up with a common application for grants. <laughs> and common outcome measures. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from a state staff, well, we just want you to do this report. It's really easy. It'll just take a second. Don't worry, it won't take, it, it won't take long. But when you've done 10 of those for three different organizations, now you're talking a lot about a lot. And it ends up spending a lot of time and a lot of energy that could be better used working with somebody to keep them in their housing or to get them into housing. So please, please work on this. It's my Christmas witch. <laughs> Michael, same question. What would you like the audience to know? Um, 
First and foremost, that you have more power than you think. A lot of times I see people not realize the power they have. And I think I want people to know you shouldn't be afraid of putting yourself out there and getting... Oh. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid of putting yourself out there and fighting for what you believe in. Uh, and don't be afraid of the no's. Um, and then the other thing I want people to know is... Uh, Check out mnlean.org. <laughs> That's our uh, website for the Lived Experience Advocacy Network. Uh, we really want to partner with as many different lived experience groups and people because the, the work is going to be led by people with lived experience. It's already happening. So we all need to connect with each other. Oh, and then one more thing, too, is on the Lean website, we're working to create a lived experience job slash volunteer board. So I think that'll be a really useful tool for a lot of people in this room. If you're looking to hire someone specifically for a lived experience position, great example would have been like the Mitch Justice Consultants for that role. We're going to have like a job board where there's one centralized place where if you're looking to hire someone with lived experience, you can post it there. Or if you're looking to have volunteers involved like the uh, Shift Collaborative had an event where they were asking people with lived experience to come and give their input. We want to kind of just create a centralized place for that, for everybody. Yes, hire lived experts. Thank you. Tamara? Thank you. Well, I grew up hearing the thing about, you know, speak truth to power and how that's really important. And in my mind, is always, when are we going to realize we're the power? And I think that's in this room and beyond. And I want to carry that forward. So that's one. Two, I have a ask for policies. I think there's a lot of individual, people get caught in individual cycles of blame a lot. And there's so many policies that we know that created where we're at today. And I would love more general awareness in the general public about that. I'd love some of the newspapers to speak to the policies, the history of our founding of our country, and the, a lot of the same patterns of who's directly impacted by homelessness is uh, found in, in the rather, whether it's the racial covenants or the exclusionary practices in housing in general. Thank you. Renal, what would you like people to know? Okay, first, noted Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm new at Minnesota Housing. I'm about six weeks in as the new Assistant Commissioner for Housing Stability. Um, and it's, I've been told that I am the government now, which feels very weird because this is my first time in government. But I'm really excited to be in government in this moment um, and thankful to the governor and lieutenant governor for their vocal and dedicated support um, around the needs to prevent and end homelessness to our legislature and Representative Keeler, you're such an incredible champion for $2.6 billion over five agencies, across five agencies to do really important needed work. And this community of advocates who I've counted myself among for many years like this is hard one and we, we did this over a number of years, all of our hard work and effort um, and strategizing and contacting people and building power, it, it paid off and we know we're not done. We know there's more work to be done. There's more that we need to do in terms of the ways that we approach this work and how we lead with love and how we build power together to shift the systems that need shifting. Um, and at Minnesota Housing, uh, with a, the really great housing stability team that I have the opportunity to work with, we're working really hard to bring on some additional dollars that came out this year and, and bringing forward some hopefully incredible programs uh, around Bring It Home um, in, the, in the future as well. Uh, so just a, an exciting time to, to be an advocate and to work in government uh, to try to do things well and to get resources to the communities that need them the most. So for those who don't know, how can people get involved? What can they do? How can they become advocates? How can they utilize or harness lived experience folks? And we're gonna start with Michael. Yeah. 
Um, I think for our speaking to the lived experience piece specifically first, the our county, city, uh, COCs, the state, when you're hiring people who are going to be working directly with uh, people who are experiencing homelessness, or um, have people with lived experience on the interview panel. Uh, I've seen Hennepin County start doing that, and I think it really pays off because uh, you know somebody can have a lot of degrees and blah blah blah, but if you don't have that person-centered understanding, that's not trainable. That's it has something within you, and people with lived experience are great at identifying that and pulling that out as critical. Um, what else to get involved? Um, first of all, don't come from a deficit perspective. There is so much abundance, so don't be afraid, like I said before, of like fighting for what you need and what you believe in, uh, and you know, not taking no. Don't be afraid of those no's. Tamara? I would say just the one thing we have a lot of opportunity to live into fully what's working well, but also just let go of the things that we know aren't. And I, I think that makes a lot of space to move things forward better and differently too. And then the second, I would say, you know, yes, all about work-life balance and talk to neighbors, friends out there in personal lives with all things you're learning. I and mean, that's how we change the tide too, so that more people get involved, even if they don't, you know, they don't see their role in it. How do we get more people to know we all have a, a space and place and a resource to share to contribute to this issue? Thank you. <laughs> Renal, what would you like people to know? Yeah. Um, well, so you all are here. You're, you've shown up, and I think that's a really important thing um, around ending and preventing homelessness. You show up. You show up to this conference. You show up to Day on the Hill. You show up to talk to your neighbors. You show up to talk to your legislator. You are the experts in your own experience, and you are the experts in your work. You know so much more than many others do and you have the opportunity to share what you know and what you're learning and what people are telling you directly with others. And that, hopefully, will help us prevent and end homelessness for good. Shane, close us out with some words of wisdom. What would you <laughs> like us to know? <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to get involved. Uh, you know, the homeless survey is coming up. They need people to do the surveys. Um, being on a board of directors at a nonprofit is very interesting and very valuable, and people are always looking for board members. Uh, reviewing RFPs, proposals. I'm sure OEL right now is looking for people to review their proposals that are due on Thursday and um, for emergency shelter grant. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think just trying to get out there and get involved as much as you can, uh, trying to learn about communities you may not be familiar with um, and realize you can always keep learning and that it's important to keep learning. Um, yeah, I think that sums it up. Keep doing what you're doing and remember, if you contact your legislature, it actually really works and they get back to you. I found that out this year because I couldn't do that before when I was a state staff and this year, <laughs> they all got back to me. <laughs> it was great. Well, thank you so much. So one more time, I want y'all to get up on your feet because I know we've been up here a little bit. Y'all stay. All right. Come on now. Don't keep me waiting. All right. I want you guys to give a big, hearty round of applause. This is your family up here. For Michael Giovanni, Tamara Stark, Renal Ray, and Jane Lorenz. And one quick shout out to Erica in the back. She's small but mighty, and she always comes through in the clutch. Thank you, Erica. Now, after the individual award winners, we are now going to move on to the organizational award winners that you've heard about already, but we're going to ask them to come up and share some words of inspiration, information about their organization, um, and 
um, hopefully you'll get to know a little bit more about the incredible work they're doing and it might inspire your own work. So um, for the American Indian Community Housing Organization or ACO, I'd like to welcome uh, Leanne and um, company to come on up. So I'm, I'm here with my ACO team, they're right, they're right here at this table, and um, I'm also here, I always imagine that my community stands with me and behind me um, when I come to um, speak, and I'm here to just accept um, this recognition on behalf of our organization. Uh, we are, you know, the American Indian Community Housing Organization, um, ACO, we've been around since 1993. And um, first, I do want to just thank the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless for having this, these awards and this recognition. Um, the first time I went to the Capitol, you know, was into the year 2000. I was a youth advocate. I worked in housing, and we went down with MCH, and that was my first experience talking with elected leaders, and it was, it was overwhelming. But we were supported by MCH. They taught us how to do it and I was there with young people. And um, so I think that the work MCH does year after year is so important for one, lifting up our, our field, and then two, bringing more people into the work and, and talking about the issues of housing. Um, so I wanna thank MCH. Um, I just wanna say that I know that we stand uh, in a field of dedicated workers, advocates, nonprofits, faith organizations, state and federal org agencies and organizations and communities across Minnesota that work every day to be, to be there, to take, um, to find immediate responses, uh, to find effective approaches, and to offer real support. So we're happy to be in this work with you and to be able to do so in accordance with our traditional indigenous values and practices at the forefront. Um, last night, I came here a lot yesterday and I presented on indigenous solutions in action. That was the name of the workshop. And then I, I left here and I went back to our organization and did that. And I did that with my team. So when I got back, um, Rose had made tobacco ties, had set up the tables, um, had organized the food. We had a community member who made the food, cooked the food. Um, Kayla Jackson, who's our, our Gainouin Food Sovereignty um, Director, she is the person who was there serving the food with Alina, our AmeriCorps. And then our case manager, um, who is, is very sad, it was her last day. She was there helping set up. Um, and then the community showed up, and the community helped um, be there. And we had two graduates who, who had achieved their, their diploma. So we do an honoring ceremony um, for our community. And we have uh, 29 units of permanent supportive housing on site at our at our uh, Gamaji Minol Bamadiziwin building. And, um, our whole community came out to support these two young people and their, um, their children were there, their young son and then their baby. And um, we did it in a traditional way where um, we asked a, a community elder and spiritual leader to come and talk, to talk about um, the importance of what they had achieved and to wish them well, and then to give some of, the, some of our traditional teachings. And then we had um, uh, our hand drum, um, our traditional singer was there to do an honor song. And then um, our staff, we had um, traditional blankets that we wrapped the graduates in. And our community came up um, while that honor song was being sung to, to congratulate them, um, to tell them how much they mean to us, and to um, wish them the best, to wish them the best in life. And that's what I, I believe when you have organizations, you have the ability to create that community space and that, and that community, the belonging that we all need. Um, so I wanna say on behalf of ACO, it's a, you know organization that's been around for 30 years that um, I really wanna say that there's been the community members who first had the idea and the dream to have an organization that would respond um, to community issues, but to do it in an indigenous way and that the workers that came, the leaders that came, the board members who came to help breathe life into that dream and to, to go from um, our Dabanui Gun Shelter, which has been in operation since 1999, it's a domestic violence emergency shelter, um, to we had Oshki Transitional Housing, we have affordable housing at Indaji, and we have our permanent supported housing at Bukamaji. And then all of the um, support, the creative cultural supports in programming that have been put in place by workers, the team,
but also community members who come with ideas and they make these things happen. Um, so I wanna just say uh, on behalf of all the people who have worked over 30 years to make this um, work possible, I wanna just accept this award. Um, I just wanna say miigwech uh, for, this, for lifting up the work every year to provide more support, more shelter, more homes and more advocacy and, and actually more collective community across the state as we work on these issues. So miigwech. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Street Voices of Change and Align Minneapolis to come up and share remarks. Hello, good friends. How are you doing today? My name is Jerry. I'm from Street Voices. I'm in Northern Plains, Rapaho from Marine River Reservation. We are the voices for, for the uh, people to end homelessness and open new horizons from within. I hope and make a stand and be proud. It means thank you, my language. Hello, my name is Cecil. Uh, I'm a senior member of Street Voices. Uh, Street Voices has been a resource and uh, a support system, pardon me, a support system throughout my journey through homelessness. So I'm very honored and happy to be here on behalf of Street Voices. Thank you. Um, my My name is Stefan. Uh, I'm one of the original members of Street Voices. And when this group started, we had not a clue. We was just glad to be in a space of people who sought something. We didn't know what we sought, so we went, we went and started this group and we found out that we had some real power, first of all within ourselves, we now had control of our own agency within. Uh, and one thing led to another. We ended up at the Capitol. We ended up pressing legislation. Uh, we ended up growing to 150 members in four different locations. Uh, certain members in our group sit on certain committees with the mayor uh, and other little committees. But I'd just like to say this. In the last, I've been homeless for 11 years. Uh, I've been at Street Voices for seven years. And I'm starting to see what I call a tedious and meticulous process of dehumanizing in our communities, in our homeless communities. So I just want to say this and this is it. I pray that today we can build a new city on this run in. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there it go. Thank you. My name is Tyra Thomas, and I am one of the original members of Street Voices of Change. Uh, it's uh, certainly an honor to um, receive this award. We've lost a lot of people in our community and in our group over the years while they were homeless and uh, formerly homeless. There's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, so it's an honor to be in this space. We will be celebrating our seven-year anniversary on Thursday. <clears throat> We've done a lot of organizing. We've been to the Capitol and back, commissioner's office, um, 
nation, national level. Um, most of our group has went through organizational training through Midwest, well, good few, um, been uh, to Midwest Academy training. Uh, I think the most part right now is I want to thank folks how we got here. Uh, would like to thank uh, the Minnesota Coalitions for Homeless. Would like to thank Representative Keeler, who's uh, uh, here. Keeler, Heather Keeler, um, Mike Howard, Hausman. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Central Lutheran, um, Basilica St. Mary's, uh, Office to Hen Homelessness, David Hewitt. Uh, I'd also like, to, we would like to thank um, our staff, Pastor Melissa, um, Katie uh, Dillon from uh, Align, Janice Anderson uh, from uh, Basilica. Uh, we did have four locations before COVID uh, where we met. Um, that was the Covenant, Central Lutheran, which is our original space, Dignity Center, and the Basilica. Um, and also, when we are under renovations, uh, Westminster would like to thank them as well. And um, also like to thank um, our members. Um, like I said, blood, sweat, and tears, and we stuck together. We stuck together and made some great accomplishments. Um, yeah, that's what I got. Thank you. And I'm Katie Dillon from Align Minneapolis. Um, Align Minneapolis, we are a coalition of 17 member faith congregations in Minneapolis, along with people with lived experience. Um, really, we see lived experience as being foundational to our work. It was mentioned that our legislative priorities are driven by the work of Street Voices of Change. But beyond that, the work of Street Voices of Change is interwoven into all that we do as an organization. All of the things that we are committed to is really driven by and, and along with our, our folks uh, at Street Voices of Change. Um, so, of course, uh, that looks structurally like including people with uh, lived experience from Street Voices of Change on our steering committee um, and really at all decision making tables. Um, we want to have uh, the voices present to make sure that in the guiding of our work, we're really centering their voices. And of course, you know, uh, as we do this work, I love this picture of us at the state capitol. Sometimes it looks like showing up. Um, sometimes it's messy, sometimes it's hard. Uh, it's always full of joy um, and, and sometimes tears and walking with folks on every part of their housing journey. Um, but that is really where the value lies. We see so much value in, um, in the work of Street Voices and to Stefan's point, seeing uh, street Voices realize the power that they have when they're sitting at the tables um, and really, um, you know, driving that, driving that work further and further, um, holding our organization accountable, holding other organizations accountable. Um, again, it's not easy work, uh, but that is, that is really the valuable work. So thank you so much uh, for honoring us with the award today and honoring Street Voices of Change. Uh, we hope to continue to be an example of how in this work to end homelessness, we are stronger together. <laughs>